Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I hope you all are enjoying the John Brown video so far. He's definitely a more complicated figure than most people give him credit for, and in this video we learn about his overall plan for freeing African Americans in bondage throughout the South before he heads to Kansas and takes part in the horrible atrocities in that territory. John Brown's plan to arm runaway slaves to end the bondage present in the South did not start with discussions with Frederick Douglass. When the Compromise of 1850 led to stricter laws towards runaway slaves, Brown turned his wool warehouse, while he still controlled it, into a location along the Underground Railroad, and to combat slave hunters, he formed the League of Gileadites. Brown organized this group of black men, women, and children to physically fight men who traveled north to reclaim runaway slaves. Brown told them, do not delay one moment after you are ready. You will lose all your resolution if you do. Let the first blow be the signal for all to engage, and when engaged, do not do your work by halves, but make clean work with your enemies, and be sure you meddle not with any others. If a member was captured and taken to trial, those on trial should create an explosion in the courtroom and whisk away the prisoners to safety during the confusion. What he was saying was revolutionary at the time for a white man to fully endorse the violent acts and murders of slave catchers and call for whites to assist in their concealment against federal law. The fact that he included women and even children in the fight for equal rights is also revolutionary. He was a supporter of women's rights. His daughter recalled that he traveled far and wide to hear the women's rights activists of the time speak and inside his home all children shared tasks equally without adhering to gender stereotypes. The boys and girls did chores indoors and outdoors. Frederick Douglass was surprised to find the sons of the family serving food and washing dishes when he had his dinner with them. At the Brown home in North Elba, the family eked out a meager living in the mountainous terrain. The out-of-the-way location was chosen by Garrett Smith because he felt the northern cities would feel uneasy about a large population of free blacks living near them. At North Elba in 1850, the Brown family owned $500 worth of property. It was basically a subsistence lifestyle, making very little to sell to the outside market. More than just wanting to help African Americans cultivate a community and crops, the local whites, who were taken aback by the sudden appearance of the black community, overcharged the black community for goods. Brown attempted to step in and right as many wrongs as possible. 1854 was a big year for the Browns, and it is directly tied with the passing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act by Congress. That legislative body wanted to create states out of the territories acquired from the Louisiana Purchase. As people moved west, they began to settle in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, and as the population grew, they would meet the required number of people to create their own state. However, a big question came up. Would Kansas or Nebraska be free or slave? As per the agreement in the Missouri Compromise, any state above the 3630 parallel should be free but slave states sought to bring more states and senators in on their side of slavery. Thus, popular sovereignty was introduced by Stephen Douglas as a way to settle the situation. The people of the proposed state would simply vote on whether they would accept slavery or not. This resulted in pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers moving into the Kansas Territory to give their voting power to their respective sides. Three of the Brown children traveled to Kansas as a way to fight against slavery and to start a new life in an area with new opportunities. Owen, Frederick, and Salmon Brown left their homes in Ohio for Kansas in 1854. With ten cattle, three horses, and some personal possessions, first going to Illinois, wintering there, and arriving in Kansas by April 1855, about eight miles from the town of Osawatomie. The three sons would not be alone long. John Jr. and Jason would make their way to Kansas that spring. They traveled by boat aboard the new Lucy. Cholera broke out among the passengers, and Jason's oldest child, Austin, would pass away. When the boat stopped in Waverly, Missouri, the Browns disembarked and buried Austin in a thunderstorm, but when they returned to the boat, the ship's captain pulled away, leaving them stranded in Missouri. The captain was needlessly cruel, since he knew that the family had gotten off for the purpose of burying their loved one, and that the family had tickets to travel as far as Kansas City. They would travel by wagon, facing discrimination for being anti-slavery, and northerners along the way, but they would arrive at the camp outside of Osawatomie that the family called Brown Station on May 7th. John Brown thought hard about joining his family in Kansas, but other things were on his mind. 
In 1854, he had started recruiting for a raid on the Federal Arsenal at Harper's Ferry to take place very soon. Having dedicated his life to the destruction of slavery, Brown asked his black neighbors in North Elba and even Frederick Douglass, along with other prominent African Americans, how he could best help them. He began to think that he could help African Americans as a whole by traveling to Kansas. Other things drove him toward the idea of going to Kansas. His son John Jr. requested that his father raise money for guns and send them to Kansas because the violence was getting worse as more people flooded into the territory. John raised money for weapons at a convention of reformers called the Radical Political Abolitionists in Syracuse, New York in June 1855. He set off on his journey to Kansas with his son-in-law Henry Thompson in August, stopping in Ohio to pick up more weapons including revolvers, rifles, ammunition, and several short, heavy broadswords. They loaded all the supplies into wagons, bought a horse for $160 in Chicago, then proceeded overland. Along the way, their horse got sick, forcing them to only travel six to eight miles a day. Running low on funds, they ate crackers, eggs, and prairie chickens they shot along the way. They stopped in Waverly to exhume the body of Austin to give him a proper burial in Kansas. They arrived in Brown Station on October 7th, where they found that torrential rains had ruined many crops and illness plagued the whole camp. By November, he helped obtain crude homes for his children to get them out of the elements. They had lived in tents for most of 1855. The family was in a good state by that month. In the fight against slavery, Brown would have a strong opponent, a former senator of Missouri and pro-slavery activist, David Rice Atchison, helped to organize and induce Missourians to cross the border into Kansas, vote illegally, and terrorize abolitionists. A pro-slavery Missouri leader said to the border ruffians, To those who have qualms of conscience as to violating the laws, state or national, I say the time has come when such impositions must be disregarded, since your rights and property are in danger, and I advise you, one and all, to enter every election district in Kansas and vote at the point of the bowie knife and revolver. Enough fraud took place that 38 of the 40 Kansas representatives were pro-slavery. Those pro-slavery politicians implemented strict laws against the abolitionists, making it a felony to speak out against slavery. This is not to say that all those who came as anti-slavery to Kansas were like John Brown. Most opposed slavery because they did not want African Americans in the state of Kansas, whether free or slave. The discussions by free state groups in Kansas bear this out. When the Brown family were approached soon after they arrived in Kansas by some border ruffians, the men from Missouri asked which side they fell on. John Jr. stunned them by saying they were free state men, and more than that, we are abolitionists. They, unlike many other free staters, opposed slavery for moral reasons. In November 1855, Charles Dow, a free state Ohioan, was shot in the back by Franklin N. Coleman, a pro-slavery Alabamian. The squabble originated from Coleman cutting timber on Dow's land, but because the two men were on opposite sides of this civil war in Kansas, it quickly became political. Jacob Branson, the only witness to the murder, was anti-slavery, so the pro-slavery sheriff arrested Branson on false charges and set a high bail to prevent him from testifying against Coleman. Free Staters rescued Branson and brought him to safety in Lawrence, and this would result in what became known as the Wakarusa War the first conflict in which John Brown participated. Pro-slavery supporters planned to attack Lawrence, and word got to Brown, who came into Lawrence with some of his sons, riding in a wagon bordered with poles with bayonets attached to them. After talking with free state leaders, he was appointed a captain in the 1st Brigade of Kansas Volunteers, commanding a company of men called the Liberty Guards. Before he could get a taste of battle, the governor of the territory got both sides to stand down, but tensions would flare up again. In 1856, at the Osawatomie Free State Convention, candidates were chosen to represent Kansas, of which John Jr. was recommended. John Brown served as a chairman of the convention as they prepared for possible violence as new elections were to take place. The country and Kansas in particular entered 1856 with controversy and it would continue throughout the year. 1856 was the year of the infamous Potawatomi Massacre perpetrated by John Brown. One of Brown's biographers put it best when he stated, Larger forces contributed to the massacre. John Brown was no designing troublemaker. If anything, he had ended 1855 with an overly optimistic view of the Kansas situation, which he thought had moved clearly to the free state side. Nor was his deed simply an act of revenge against his enemies in Kansas, 
it can best be explained as an act of terrorism improvised at a moment when outside forces, some local and recent, others national and long developing, converged in his psyche and set off within him an explosion of vindictive rage. Earlier that year, a free stater was brutally hacked with hatchets and knives, left mortally wounded on his doorstep with his wife screaming in horror. Also that year, the President of the United States, Franklin Pierce, officially supported the pro-slavery government, even though the territory was shifting or had shifted to anti-slavery. He even called up troops to enter Kansas. John Jr., upset about the turn of events, wrote, The question here is, shall we here be freemen or slaves? The South is arming and sending in their men. The North is doing the same thing. It is now decreed and certain that the slave power must desist from its aggressive acts upon the settlers of Kansas, or if they do not, the war cry heard upon our plains will reverberate not only through the hemp and tobacco fields of Missouri, but through the rice swamps, the cotton and sugar plantations of the sunny South. Early in 1856, President Franklin Pierce began to side or at least support the pro-slavery government in Kansas by proclaiming the pro-slavery government legitimate and that opposition to it would be considered treason. At a meeting held by Free Soilers in Osawatomie in April, a group discussed a way to oppose the pro-slavery laws and the government in Kansas. They also discussed not paying taxes as a way to fight back against federal government decisions. John Brown got up and stated he was an abolitionist of the old stock, was dyed in the wool, and that blacks were his brothers and equals, that he would rather see this union dissolved and the country drenched with blood than to pay taxes to the amount of one hundredth part of a mill. His statement about equality infuriated many of the group of free soilers. Just because they opposed slavery did not mean that they sought equality. Brown was an outlier. Reverend Martin White got up and walked out in disgust at Brown's statement and would eventually join the pro-slavery side of the conflict. The Browns quickly got a reputation as ardent abolitionists and a warrant went out for their arrest. John went to find out if the pro-slavery judge, Sterling Cato, would stand by the warrants, so he sent two of his sons to enter the tavern which acted as the courtroom for Osawatomie. The judge did not order them arrested, but the court did pass sentences and punish abolitionists for petty crimes. When the Browns and thirty men armed entered the parade ground as part of the Potawatomi rifles, the court broke up and the judge never again held court at Osawatomie. On May 21st, around 750 pro-slavery supporters formed and attacked Lawrence, Kansas, destroying the town by burning its buildings and destroying property, like the printing press of the anti-slavery newspaper. The Browns heard about this disruption and the attack on the anti-slavery movement in Kansas and rode with members of the Potawatomi Rifles to attack the ruffians who attacked Lawrence. As they proceeded, word got to them of the caning of Charles Sumner by Preston Brooks. Senator Sumner had delivered a speech called The Crime Against Kansas, where he stated that Senator Butler was in love with the harlot slavery. Butler's cousin, Congressman Preston Brooks, took exception to this verbal attack and began beating him with a cane. Brooks would say of the pummeling, Every lick went where I intended. For about the first four or five licks, he offered to make a fight, but I plied him so rapidly that he did not touch me. Towards the last, he bellered like a calf. I wore my cane out completely, but saved the head, which is gold. The fragments of the cane are begged for as sacred relics. Every southern man is delighted, and the abolitionists are like a hive of disturbed bees. They are making all sorts of threats. It would not take much to have the throats of every abolitionist cut. John Brown was incensed by the news. What happened next would be a combination of the attacks and counterattacks by anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces in Kansas, all of which enraged Brown as he saw the country given in to pro-slavery forces. On Saturday, May 24, 1856, Brown led a group of his sons and a few friends armed with rifles, revolvers, and freshly sharpened broadswords to a house on Potawatomi Creek. They knocked on the door, attempting to draw out the man, but a rifle barrel protruded through a hole in the house and the party left. Next, they came to the house of James Doyle, a Tennessean, who came to Kansas to get away from the financially dominated area by slaveholders, but joined the pro-slavery supporters in Kansas. Doyle and two sons were on Cato's pro-slavery court that the Browns broke up. The Browns knocked on the door, asking for directions. When the door opened, they barged in, accusing Doyle of pro-slavery actions, then took him and his two oldest sons outside the cabin. They spared the 16-year-old son, leaving him in the house with his frightened mother and sisters. 
because he had not been part of the court. The Browns led the three men toward the woods 200 yards away. Then Owen and Salmon Brown hacked away at them with the broadswords, and John Brown delivered a single pistol shot into the head of James to make sure he was dead. The next home they came to was Alan Wilkinson's home, the acting district attorney in Cato's court. They got him to come out of the house by asking him to show them how to get to Dutch Henry Sherman's cabin. When he opened the door, the party took hold of him and asked him his stance on slavery. When he identified that he was for it, the group said he would be taken as a prisoner. Allen attempted to extricate himself from the situation by stating that his wife had the measles and needed someone to stay with her, and that if he was allowed to leave to get someone, he would be willing to turn himself into the group. John Brown asked the wife if there was any neighbor available to look after her. She said they were all away. John said it matters not and took her husband out of the cabin, about 150 yards away, where John's son-in-law and a friend of the family did the same to Allen as the Brown sons did to the Doyles. Next, they waded across the creek to the home of James Harris, where they hoped to find Dutch Henry Sherman, a German immigrant and ardent pro-slavery supporter who owned the tavern where the court took place and had many run-ins with the Browns. Fortunately for him, he was on the prairie searching for lost cattle. They did find his brother Bill Sherman along with some others in the cabin. They interrogated the group, and finding only a bill guilty of pro-slavery actions, they took him outside, slashed him with the broadswords, and submerged his dead body in the creek. The Browns and the rest of the party washed the blood off their broadswords and headed back to their camp on Middle Ottawa Creek. The reality set in of what they had done when they made it back to camp. Some of them broke down and cried, even though John tried to insist that it was in self-defense to defend others against violence. John Jr. and Jason ran to a family member's house, although they hadn't taken part in the killings. Word spread that the Browns were the ones who committed it, and they feared for their lives. Eventually, both John Jr. and Jason were captured by pro-slavery forces and turned over to federal soldiers. Both men were put in chains and beaten by their captors. John Jr. was overcome with madness, as people then described it, and had to be restrained. At one point, the two men were taken to Osawatomi to a camp and John Jr. had to be bound to a pole by an ox chain, and when he wouldn't stop shrieking, the soldiers beat him into unconsciousness. Them and five other Free Staters were bound together by chains to their ankles and forced to walk 65 miles to Lecompton. Once there, the two men were investigated and Jason was released, but John Jr. was charged with high treason for being a Free State politician. When Jason returned to his home, he found that pro-slavery forces had burned his cabin like the rest of the Brown family homes. John Jr. will be released on bail in September. It would be in the days after the Potawatomi Massacre that John Brown would meet one of the more influential men for his own story. James Redpath, a writer for the New York Tribune, stumbled on Brown's camp. The Tribune was an anti-slavery paper, and Brown was more than happy to tell him what he was fighting for, leaving out the massacre. Redpath would go on to be Brown's first biographer. While hidden in the wilderness, Brown got word that Henry paid a leader of a pro-slavery group of armed men, the same man who captured both John Jr. and Jason, was planning an attack on a town. Determined to stop it, Brown and his eight men left their hideout and met up with 20 other Free State men at Prairie City, where they partook in religious services. While in church, a messenger burst into the building telling them that the Missourians were coming. Six men attacked the town, but the Free Staters fought them off, capturing three of them and riding off for an area known as Blackjack for the stand of Blackjack Oaks. The slave state forces numbered 55, outnumbering Brown's men. In the battle, the Free Staters couldn't hit the slave staters from behind their wagon barricade, but they did manage to hit their horses, making the group of men immobile. Brown was winning the battle, but an unlikely event captured the victory. Frederick Brown, the burly son of John, who was supposed to take care of the horses, came riding Owen's horse, wielding a sword and urging the Free Staters on, saying the Missourians are surrounded. Terrified that what he said was true, Pate and his group surrendered to Frederick and John Brown. A few days after the battle, Brown ran into federal troops led by future Union General Colonel Edwin Sumner. Among the federal soldiers was a young officer named Jeb Stewart. Stewart and Brown would meet again a few years later. Brown handed over his prisoners to the federal troops, but Sumner did not arrest Brown, even though there was a warrant for his arrest. On into August, Brown and his group raided a few pro-slavery locations for supplies to keep up the war effort, but on his trip to Nebraska City in the Nebraska Territory, 
he would meet one of his die-hard followers. Aaron Dwight Stevens was a commander in the Free State Army. Stevens had fought in the Mexican-American War and fought Native Americans afterward. In early 1856, he had been jailed in New Mexico for rebelling against an officer. He escaped and made his way to Kansas to fight for the anti-slavery side of the conflict. He would remain by Brown's side for the rest of their lives. In Nebraska City, much of his group split up. Of his sons, only Jason and Frederick stayed with him. Some went to Iowa, others to Ohio, and some went to North Elba. Despite his group of followers getting smaller, his legend grew in the minds of slave staters. They envisioned him everywhere in the territory, terrorizing them around every bend of the road. The mere rumor that John Brown was coming caused pro-slavery meetings to dissipate. He continued to attack slavery in Kansas, but because of the Pottawatomie Massacre, he was forced to travel in secret. August and September of 1856 would see Kansas hit a new high for violence. President Franklin Pierce put John W. Geary as the territorial governor, and his anti-slavery stance caused an uproar with the pro-slavery settlers in Kansas. From the time of his appointment in July until he arrived in September, pro-slavery forces were determined to get rid of all free staters in the territory. They launched a brutal and violent war against the free staters, with one newspaper describing the roads strewn with the dead bodies of free staters. Brown formed his own group to combat the pro-slavery forces. He would call his group the Kansas Regulars, and he would go to literal war with the slave staters. Brown raided pro-slavery farms and took what he and his group needed to continue the fight against slavery, believing that if it belonged to pro-slavery families, it could be confiscated to fight against slavery. He captured a great deal of pro-slavery soldiers, but almost immediately let them go, but not before lecturing them about how their side of the war was wrong. He stated, You want to make or keep other people slaves. Do you not know that your wicked efforts will end in making slaves of yourselves? You come here to make this a slave state. You are fighting against liberty, which our revolutionary fathers fought to establish in this republic, where all men should be free and equal, with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Therefore, you are traitors to liberty and to your country of the worst kind and deserve to be hung to the nearest tree. Go in peace. Go home and tell your neighbors and friends of your mistake. We deprive you only of your arms, and do that only lest some of you are not yet converted to the right. On August 29th, John Brown and his group led 150 head of cattle toward the town of Osawatomie, but stopped on the hills overlooking the town. The next morning, the pro-slavery forces advanced toward the town, killing Brown's son Frederick. The young man had spent the evening with some family and friends away from the group and was shot down in the road by Reverend Martin White. News came to John Brown of the impending attack, and they rode off for the town. An untested member of the group confessed that he had never been under fire. Brown gave him some advice. Take more care to end life well than to live long. He placed his 38 men in the tree line, concealed from view. When the pro-slavery soldiers got close, Brown ordered his men to fire. This stunned the slave staters, who numbered around 200 men. Brown's Kansas regulars killed between 20 and 30 and wounded at least 40. The slave staters charged into the woods, scattering Brown's men, but many of them got away, having caused a great deal of damage to the enemy. The pro-slavery soldiers then turned their anger on the town of Osawatomie, burning it to the ground. This was a defeat for John Brown, but he would gain a great reputation from the battle. He would earn the nickname Osawatomie Brown and show the world that northern abolitionists and anti-slavery advocates were not cowards who shirked away from a fight. His resistance to slavery and its advocates demonstrated the northerners' resolve, gaining him nationwide attention. The South portrayed him as a pariah, but the North saw him as a hero for standing up to slavery. Governor Geary arrived in September and immediately ordered the disbanding of all armed groups, both pro-slavery and anti-slavery. He was also lenient towards those who had committed murder by basically saying to let things go and start over. The persistence of Geary and the fear put in pro-slavery forces by John Brown helped settle the tension within the territory. By the end of September, John Brown would leave Kansas and head east, still determined to fight slavery wherever it existed.